1. Some many years ago, I worked customer service for a company that managed a Medicare Part D drug plans. And the annual enrollment period rolled around. And during that time, it got chaotic. On top of the usual caring for customers, answering their questions, fixing problems, we had to enroll people into our plans. And it was a bit of a process. There were questions that needed to be asked and answered, information that had to be imparted, and at the end of it all, a long spiel explaining our responsibilities and the customer's responsibilities and important information the customer had to verbally consent to. So in the midst of this, I get a woman who is angry she had to do this and is angry at how much time the whole process is taking. I explain to her I'm trying to get her through this all as quickly as possible. Then we get to the end, and I explain that I have to read her the terms of service and I need her to verbally confirm yes to it all. Immediately, she starts carrying on how she just doesn't have time to listen to it. I tell her I am legally required to read this to her. She doesn't want to hear it. Just sign her up. I explain again that to complete the sign-up process, I have to read this to her and she needs to acknowledge it. Another round of she doesn't want to hear it, doesn't want to agree to it. I can just skip it and sign her up. No, I can't. I can read through it quickly. However, she still needs to hear it and say yes. More arguing she doesn't want to. Let's just say she agrees to it and I can sign her up. By this time, I'm thinking, lady, if you would just let me read this instead of arguing with me, we could have been done by now. Which I couldn't say. Instead... I inform her that I have to read this agreement to her and she needs to verbally agree to it. If she doesn't, I will not be able to sign her up for Medicare Part D. She will not have a Part D plan. She will not be able to enroll in a plan until next year's enrollment period. And she will have to pay a fine for not having a plan this year. She ignores all that, tells me to sign her up, and hangs up. Of course, I don't sign her up. And I write down the whole incident in the call log that I explained several times that I needed to go over the agreement and get her consent, the penalties to her if she didn't, and that she refused, and that I did not sign her up. Several weeks after the new year, a co-worker sitting near me gets a call from a woman who is furious that when she went to get a prescription filled, the pharmacy wasn't able to run the insurance on it. And when they checked that she didn't have a Part D drug plan, the co-worker asked for the woman's name, which was the woman who I didn't sign up. My co-worker checked and said the caller did not have a plan with us. Worse for the caller, we could not enroll her since she had missed the enrollment period. Imagine how much easier things would have gone for everyone if that woman had just let me do my job and read the service agreement and she had just said yes to it. 2. I own a historic downtown building that consists of several units that are each occupied by different businesses. Picture a strip mall, but in a historic building. It used to be an opera house before it was divided up by the prior owners. It's an attractive spot because I've also got private parking off the street, and it offers my tenants a really nice storefront on our town's main street. It's not a major source of income for me, so I actually charge well under what I could, and I cover the costs of heating it which is a very big deal in New England. I bought the place specifically so a friend of mine could start his dream business, and my other tenants are also all startups by folks trying to get into business for themselves. For those reasons, I tend to be very patient and forgiving with my tenants. I don't instantly freak out if the rent is late, I don't micromanage what they do with their space, and if they get in a bind, I work with them as long as they're honest and show me the same respect I do them. So, when I describe the petty revenge I enacted on my former tenant, JJ, I want you to understand that I really did try to take the high road. But he fucked around so much, I felt he really needed to find out. Basically, a tenant who had been in the building when I bought it decided to retire and close his business. JJ was one of several prospective tenants, but was the first come, so first served. He signed his lease and told me his check for the deposit and first month were in the mail. Being a trusting person, I gave him the keys and wished him well on opening a game store. I'm an old D&D &D gamer, so it tugged my heartstrings. He was a nice enough guy in person. 
Always polite, but did this weird thing I associate with people who aren't as smart as they think they are. He tended to use a lot of $50 words to sound intelligent, but would use them incorrectly. And would screw up basic grammar like your, Y-O-U-R, and your, Y-O-U apostrophe R-E. I mention this because in some of our conversations he got really condescending, and he definitely thought he was going to pull something over on me. The promised checks never came. I told him and set up a time to get cash from him, and suddenly his kid was sick, so he couldn't meet. He sent me $100 through a payment app, and when I confirmed I got it, he ghosted me for a little bit instead of paying the rest. And by then we were into the next month, so he was now late on two months' rent. Hadn't put down his deposit, and I started talking eviction if he didn't get his shit together. Throughout this, he never said anything about having a hard time making rent or needing extra time. If he had, I would have worked with him. Instead, it was lies and excuses and bullshit. He begged for another chance, paid me a little more through the app, then mailed me two counterchecks. Both of them bounced. And when I told him, he blamed the bank. Then I found out he hadn't switched the utilities to his name, which is required in the lease. So I had to cover those to keep the power from being turned off in the dead of winter. He was now in the hole, over $4,000 with me, and wasn't paying. So I called the cops for the bounced checks. They gave him a mandatory five days to pay or charges would be pressed. He also filed a quit notice before I could file for eviction, which allowed him to avoid court. He got the payments to me, finally, by the skin of his teeth, after first trying to argue that he didn't need to pay the deposit because... I'll just get it all back anyway. I advised him that that's not how anything works. The first full payment was the deposit. So he was still short a month of rent, and if he didn't pony up, he'd be getting arrested the next day. I also reported him to the USPSIS for mailing checks he knew were going to bounce. I also decided I was going to get some petty vengeance by illegally nickeling diming that deposit as much as possible. Hired professional cleaners and a professional locksmith to change the door locks, instead of doing it myself. Three months worth of unpaid utilities, maximum late fees, fees for bounced checks. I took out everything allowable by law, and whittled that $900 deposit down to about 20 The dumbass had the temerity to text me a week after his eviction, asking about the status of his deposit being returned. I advised him that as per state law, I would be putting his check in the mail on day 30 from his original lease end date, not the quit date. So he'd be seeing that massive check in about six weeks. I then informed every landlord, realtor and property manager I know in our area about him with a warning not to rent with him. So while I sympathize with people trying to break into business, don't bite off more than you can chew and definitely don't try to fuck over someone who knows the law a lot better than you do. 3. I am a 34-year-old man who runs a marketing agency here in the UK that employs five people. I also pride myself on being fairly rational, empathetic, and level-headed. I am saying this for no other reason than to underscore how out of character this was for me. I live in a small house in a mostly student area, for the most part, it's fine. The students in the nearby houses have the occasional house party on Friday and Saturday nights, but never on weekdays. And until recently, they've usually finished by midnight, so it doesn't bother me. This new bunch of guys that moved in next door in November have been absolute dickheads, though. House parties until 5am on weekdays, letting random friends park in my driveway without asking, heckling and making fun of me as a group when we're both outside. All the good stuff. I've just rolled my eyes and ignored it for the most part, but I'm still human, so the constant disrespect still pisses me off. A couple of weeks ago, however, I was working next to my window. I saw one of them taking a bin bag full of rubbish outside, and realizing there was no space in any of their bins, just walk into my driveway and put it in mine. For some reason, despite it being far from the worst thing they've done, that just irritated the shit out of me. I don't know why that was a straw exactly, just something about the combination of both the arrogance and the fuck you presumptuousness of it combined with this bubbled up resentment from all their nonsense till now 
really got under my skin. So, a week later I woke up at 4am on a non-party day when I knew they'd be asleep. Grabbed a random bag of the nastiest rubbish I could find from someone's bin down the street. So there's nothing to point to this being me. And went to their house. In the UK, mail is delivered through your door into your house via a post box. That's freely accessible, so... I painstakingly posted all this absolutely disgusting rubbish through their letterbox. It took me a solid 20 minutes, as I had to take multiple fresh air breaks to avoid throwing up. Then, just to seal the deal, I emptied a bottle of milk through as well, just to make it extra fun for them to clean up in the morning, and taped a note saying stop talking to my girlfriend to their door to further minimize the chance of retaliation. Having seen the entrance area of their house from knocking on the door in the past, I know it's carpeted. I've never done anything like this in my life, and it might have been a bit much. <sighs> but I do feel a lot better now. 4. This happened a couple of years ago when I shared a room with my friend. A bit of backstory, we both came to Singapore to start our careers after graduating from university. We rented a master bedroom with an attached bathroom, important note for later, in Singapore, it is common for landlords to rent out their rooms while living in the house. Because of this, we were given many rules, such as laundry twice a week, only use the dryer for one hour at a time, because electricity is expensive, can only use the air conditioning for eight hours a day, can't cook since the landlord uses the kitchen. We can only use the kettle to boil water and or use the microwave to make tea, coffee, instant noodles, or reheat food. Can't use the common areas like the hall and kitchen. Don't blast music in your rooms, etc. I know these are some absurd rules. This is just what happens in Singapore when you rent a room with a landlord living in the same unit. So my friend and I had an agreement that I would do laundry on Tuesdays and he would do laundry on Fridays. We also agreed to clean the bathroom once a week. I'll try to be brief, but this revenge was done because of the things he has done that built up a lot of anger in me. He always forgets his turn to do laundry. I needed to remind him every time. He also played Dota almost every single day and blasted his speakers with the game sounds. He would sometimes ask me to help him put the laundry in the dryer because he was in the middle of playing his Dota game. I kept telling him to lower the volume, as I was usually on a video call with my girlfriend. Mind you, I used my earphones. She could hear his game sounds better than my own voice when talking to her. He would reduce the volume, but then slowly turn it up as though I didn't notice. Hell, I even bought him earphones to play Dota. He would only use them when I tell him, which is every fucking day. He would whine like a little bitch and say they're not comfortable. Then there's the bathroom. Obviously, we use the sink to brush our teeth and all that jazz, but we also had to use it to wash our cups and cutlery there. We would use the kitchen sink, but it was troublesome, as the landlord would usually be there cooking or whatever. He was a slob, probably still is. After he's done eating or drinking, whatever, he won't wash the cups or cutlery until he's going to use them the next time. There was once he just left his cutlery in the bathroom sink. Gross, I know. The next morning, I woke up to go to work. I walked into the bathroom and saw it there. I got pissed and chewed him out. He apologized. Then came one fine day. I came home early after work and decided to go to the gym. As usual, my friend was already back and playing Dota with his speakers on full volume. <sighs> I went to the bathroom to take a piss and noticed he left his beer mug in the sink. I decided to just release my anger at the gym, so I changed my clothes and headed to the gym. After the gym, I came back home all sweaty. He was still playing Dota. I straight away went into the bathroom to shower. I turned on the shower, and right before stepping in, I saw the mug was still there. I was about to lose it again. I felt like beating the shit out of him, but I'm not a violent man. I should have just sighed again the devil in me had had enough. I let the devil win this time. Remember how I came from the gym all sweaty? I took his mug, shoved my sweaty, grimy dick and balls in them, twisted the whole mug with my dick and balls in them, twisting and turning for a good ten seconds. I could see the blackish water stains on it. I thought that would be enough. 
and then put the mug back where he left it. After that, I had the best shower ever. But wait, there's more. After I came out the shower, me and him went out for dinner. On the way back, he asked me if I wanted to try a new beer. I agreed, and so we bought two bottles of beer and headed back. We got into the room and I got my mug, which is always clean and ready to be used. I popped my beer bottle and poured it into my mug. Then, I wanted to cheers with him. I didn't expect what was about to happen next. He was looking for his mug. Where's my mug? I don't know. Did you check the bathroom? He walks into the bathroom. Oh yeah, it's here. Picks it up, looks at it for a second and brings it out. I'm feeling a little bad because I had rimmed my ball sweat with it and also sure as shit he didn't wash it yet, so I gave him a chance. Don't you want to wash it first? Oh no, I washed it already. Okay. Pours his beer into his mug. Cheers! Cheers! Making sure my mug brim doesn't touch his and clinks. Both of us take a gulp from our mugs, and I'm waiting for his reaction. Huh. This beer tastes a bit different. With the biggest shit-eating grin, yeah, it's pretty good. He carried on playing Dota while I was riding on the high of what I had just witnessed with my own two eyes. To this day, he still doesn't know what I did to him. I still think about it sometimes and laugh to myself about it. 5. Years ago, when flip phones were the hot thing to own, I worked in a factory making paper. Six people in each shift constant watching the machine process in case of wrinkles, tears, or sometimes fire. Paper dust in the air had the habit of falling on fast-moving parts of the machines, and presto, almost instant fire. We usually had several small fires every year, but nothing we couldn't handle. We had all worked there ten years or more, so the trust was high that we did our work and our floor manager, John, never had to direct us to do something, until one really special day. Something to know about the factory. It was big. Really big. So north of it was a workshop with mechanics ready to help us and the other companies in the same building. East of us was a loading bay and ramps for trucks. South was another company that laminated and printed paper. West of us was an area rented out short time. Sometimes a mess hall for showing products and other times shop and warehouse for sports equipment. Everything under the same roof. This is where the problem began. After one of the worst fires we had, I was on vacation, while my co-workers tried to keep the fire as small as possible until the firemen arrived. Three people ended up with smoke inhalation damage, and two of them were okay after a few days. Paul, on the other hand, got lifelong damage. He could still work, but when a company repaired our floor, they used epoxy to seal the cracks, and Paul could suddenly not breathe. The team leader drove him to the hospital, and after inhaling Brickinal, he could breathe again. We know how badly damaged his lungs were, and any strong chemical could kill him. I had years of experience working with strong chemicals, so it never bothered me, something that would come into play later. Months after this, we changed work schedule, and our shift only worked weekends. So we'd deal with extra pay. Only hassle was the burners that would dry the paper. They could sometimes be a pain to fire up, as the safe nature friendly LPG had problems to start in cold weather. No problems, while we waited for those to work, you could start the rest of the machines that were driven by electricity. Do you all remember the warehouse west of us that sometimes got rented out? Well, for some unknown reason, pressure perhaps, their ventilation pipe was directly over the panels we used to control our machines. Sometimes we could smell leather jackets being sold next to us. One summer, they sold strawberries there, and after work, we all went there and filled our cars. Those strawberries were dirt cheap. One Saturday, someone had the bright idea to just rent the place for the weekend and spray paint their big lawnmower. We felt the fumes right away. You guessed it. Big rushed to hospital with Paul again, and I had a nice talk with the guy. At this time, we were part of the European Union, and as I had worked with chemicals, I knew the papers you had to sign, the people you had to talk to, and the documentation you had to bring with the chemicals, just to take the chemicals inside a factory. He had none of that. We talked with the company that owned the factory, and they promised to never let this happen again. That promise lasted four months. When I arrived one morning, I saw the chimney on the factory had no smoke. 
odd, I thought, as some of the earlier guys usually fire up the burners right away, as they could be tricky. After changing clothes and getting ready to open the door to the workplace, I felt it. Nauseating, strong chemical fumes, enough to melt wallpaper. I took a big breath, held it, and rushed to the coffee room, which was sunproof and had rubber isolation at the door. But inside, I could still feel the fumes. Half of the guys were there drinking coffee, the rest of the guys had taken Paul to the hospital again. It was really bad this time. Everything was shut down as nobody could work with fumes like that. They had opened up every door and window they could, but it would take hours before any work could be done. They had talked to a new guy renting the west area, and he had apparently spent the whole night spray painting a combine harvester, and all the fumes had gone directly to us. Now we come to the malicious compliance part, finally. While we were sitting there, drinking coffee, chatting, and waiting for the fumes to go away, in comes the floor manager. I've never seen John that angry, and while he never said so, I assume he got a call from the CEO that ripped him a new one as the numbers on the computer said we were all working and produced zero paper for an hour. John must have felt the fumes, but still chewed us all out even after we explained the fate of Paul. He was adamant that it wasn't that bad, and every minute the machines don't run is costing the company money. So I stood up and said to the others, you two stay and I go with John, to start up the burners. He followed me out, while I casually chatted with him, trying to look as unbothered by the fumes as I could. We had several panels to start, so I slowly walked to the first one. I felt the fumes, but I could handle strong chemical fumes as I had done it before. It seemed like the burners were on my side this day, as they absolutely refused to start. Even when they struggle, they usually get the hint about what I want them to do in 10 or 15 minutes. But this day, they were extra obstinate. When we got to the panel number two, John looked a little green in the face. But as he wanted us to work in the fumes, let us do that. Same problem with the burner again, and I looked at my watch. We had been in the fumes over 30 minutes now. Even I started to feel dizzy and nauseous by now. Not that you could see it on my face. I looked happy as normal while working on starting the machines. When we came to the third and last machine, John gave up. He was white in the face and said with a low voice, Perhaps we should wait until the fumes cleared up. Whatever you say, I said with a grin. John never yelled at us again, and I had a warm feeling when I think about that day. Fallout. On Monday, the mud really hit the fan, and safety in the place suddenly became priority number one. We had many visits from state departments, sometimes in suits, and other times in white lab coats measuring this and that. Several machines had to be rebuilt with extra added security features. Work accidents went from five a year to just one. Or numbers like that, I'm guessing here. It had massive effect, and it probably cost a pretty penny too. Paul, however, never really got well again, but he retired early and got a hefty compensation. Not only the pay he would have received for the years he should have been working until pension, but also damages both from the company, but also from a special pot of cash the union had for moments like this. Not that it can compensate for lifelong asthma and inability to run for more than a minute. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Revenge's Ice Cream, episode 338. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Before you go, please hit the like button. It really, really helps. And if you'd like early access to the videos, then you can support me on my Patreon page, linked in the description. You'll also find a link to the Hellfreezer merchandise store on Teespring. And if you enjoyed today's video, why not leave a tip? You can do that by clicking on the little heart with a dollar sign in the middle, just below the video. You don't have to do that, though, but I do appreciate it. Okay. Let me see, I don't think there's any other bits and bobs to do. Nope, so let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is... When buying something, and it's something big purchase, small purchase, whatever, something new, how do you approach reading reviews? Do you bother with them, or do you have a particular technique? Like, personally speaking, I'll look at the negative reviews first. So what I'm looking for is to see if there's any consistency in the reviews with, you know, consistent problems, or if it's just people whining because they were too dumb to use the product. Oftentimes that's the case. Then I'll look at the slightly better rated ones before I make a final decision. 
And so far that's worked out well for me. The only time I've ever had a problem when buying something is if I haven't looked at the reviews. So why don't you let me know how you approach things in a comment below. And before I go, we'll have the answer of the day from a previous video. And this one comes from Revenge's Ice Cream, episode 336. And was in relation to, I think, favourite eating utensils and plates and things. And the answer comes from Kathy Beckford. I have one set of dishes and eating utensils. I guess as far as favourites, I most likely use the spoons and bowls. Those are my go-tos for eating most things. Thank you very much, Kathy. And with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.